Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to First United Methodist Church. I'm, I talk kind of loud anyway. I get accused of speaking too loud at home because we have an open area, so I'll try to tone it down a little bit. So good to see all of you here this morning. Wonderful church to be a part of. And uh, let me go into a few announcements this morning. At 5 p.m. today, our youth band practice, 6 p.m., uh, snack Supper in UMYF, UMYF in the Annex, and 6 p.m. Bethmore Bible Study, and then there's a men's Bible study and prayer group as well. 7 p.m. on Monday, Boy Scouts in the Garage. Tuesday to March the 5th, the UMW Executive Committee will meet in the Open Door Classroom. 5.30 p.m. Praise Band Rehearsal, 6 p.m. On Tuesday, martial arts in the Miller Building, 6.30, venturing scouts in the garage, and at 7 p.m., UMW Anna Fellowship in the Welcome Center. Wednesday, March the 6th, family night dinner, followed by a Bible study at 5.45, and at 7.15 p.m., the Chancel Choir rehearsal. Thursday at March the 7th, martial arts at 6 p.m. in the Miller Building. And next Saturday, March the 9th at 11 a.m., UMW Elizabeth Fellowship uh, will meet. If you're interested in playing on our 2013 Men's Church League softball team, you're looking at the, the coach. So uh, I've got a, a, a form out in the Narthex if you want to sign up and leave your name and your phone number and we'll get a hold of you. Our first practice is going to be next Sunday afternoon, March the 10th at 4 p.m. out at the North Glen Complex. And um, we came in second place last year, and that's been eating at a lot of United Methodist members at this church for about 12 months, and we're going to do our best to do something about that this year. And then there's going to be a covered dish luncheon on Sunday, March 17th, after our 11 a.m. worship service, it's going to be hosted by the evangelism team. They'll provide the meat and the drinks. And we're asking for you to bring a, a covered dish that will feed your family and one more. And we'll be taking up a love offering to support our softball team. We're going to get, be getting new jerseys this year. Uh, second place uh, red is out, so we're going to get new colors this year. So. Uh, well, hope you, hopefully you'll come join us for that event and, and come out and support the softball team this year when we post the schedules upcoming. Are there any other announcements I may have left out this morning? Easter lilies are, are in your uh, program here this morning. Make sure you get your order in for that. Any other announcements? If not, let's prepare for our morning worship.
hymn of adoration is hymn number 334. Let us stand and sing together, Sweet, Sweet Spirit, and we will sing it twice. good singing. Please be seated. I've got a couple of things I want to ask you very quickly. And uh, first of all, we want to see if there are any very first time visitors with us. Or if you're a first time visitor to Brunswick First United Methodist Church, would you hold up your hand? Do we have some first time visitors? We have first time visitors. Bobby, right down here. Hold it up till the usher sees your hand. There you go. Um, had some first time visitors, a family and a single person who's down here visiting in the Golden Isles at, uh, at the early service this morning. So we're grateful. Thank you for being here with us. And our folks will greet you and we have a gift bag for you. Now, uh, two or three things to add to what Kip has already brought up to you this morning. Our church is planning a mission trip. You've probably seen some information on this. June 24th through July the 1st to Haiti. Uh, I am hoping this makes... Uh, I would like to go back to Haiti. I've been to Haiti, and, you know, it's one of those things now. The, the world goes from one disaster to the next disaster, and whatever is popular at the moment catches the attention. Uh, it's way off anybody's radar. But Haiti continues to be devastated. It is just, it's probably now with the earthquake that happened a couple of years ago. It's the poorest nation. It used to be the Belize was the poorest country in the Caribbean, but now it's obviously Haiti. So there's a lot of need, a lot of work. If you're interested in going, let Hans McCollum know that you've got an interest in that, and we'll determine uh, where we're going to go from there. And then uh, we, we're also joining, our missions committee has joined with the bedspread ministry. If you read the article that was in the paper several weeks ago, Reese Carroll um, came and made a presentation to our missions committee. We've got mattresses here that are cleaned and sanitized and ready to be distributed. And again, contact Hans McCollum if you can participate in that. Uh, with that, maybe help them deliver some mattresses to folks that need them. They're all assigned, and uh, they're looking for more. You might have a mattress to donate 
And if you do, call Hans McCullum and let him know, and we'll make sure that that gets taken care of. Uh, we're going to have our own form of March Madness again on March the 17th after the dinner, the cover dish dinner on Sunday, March the 17th. We're going to go across the street. I'm twisted around across the street that way to the old wood gym where we had our March Madness last year. Now, Celia, who's doing publicity for us now, is going to post video, some of the video from last year that Jim Weldy took. And this year... Susan, I'm going to have Tuck make a basket if it's the last thing I do. We tried to lift old Tuck up last year to get him close to the basket, and we came close, but we never did make one, so we're going to get one this year. And uh, so March Madness after the fundraising lunch, um, and I have suggested to our coach, you know, last year we had a winner take all because of the rain. Now, the season was shortened because of the rain. We came down to the last game of our softball team with tied with the chapel and um, – you know, when you lose a tight game like that, it's, it's often just a failure of the coaching that you got. <laughs> and we, we had to renegotiate Kip's contract for this year. And uh, so anyway, he's thinking that a change in colors is going to help the team this year. So I don't know. Anyway, you stand up and greet someone and tell them you're glad to see them here this morning. beautiful altar flowers we have this morning are given by Steve and Deborah Williams in celebration of their 29th wedding anniversary. <coughs> beautiful flowers. Inside of each pew is a red attendance pad. Please fill it out and pass it through each pew. We'd love to have a registration of your attendance this morning. Again, first time visitors, we can't grow without you, so thank you for choosing us this morning. We, uh, we're honored that you're here. Prayer concerns this morning? See one of them sitting over there already, Miss Pat Ratcliffe, so we're excited about that. Uh, please continue to pray for Casey Strickland Russell, Ann Northington, Marie Cooper, Stephen Buffy, Eddie Ratcliffe, Craig Jones, Jessica Wilson. Please continue to pray for our servicemen and women serving this great country of ours. Scotty Bennett, John Patrick Thornton, Brian Hayes, Eric Friedrich, Charles Wells, A.J. Schaefer, Lauren Maynard. Mission families serving in the mission field for us. Lovelace, Great House, Trousdale families. Keep our church in your prayers this morning. This community that we live in, our country, our leaders, our president, Congress. Keep all them in your prayers this morning. And yes, gas prices are high currently. But you know, I was on the internet up early this morning surfing the internet. Gas prices on average in Europe is almost $8 a gallon. So we don't have it as bad as we thought. So any other prayer concerns this morning? Excuse me. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's tough. Any others? Brother Jim? And I have a, a very, very special unspoken prayer request that uh, I would like to lift up. And if you bring it up before the Lord... Anytime today or this week in your devotions, just say, Lord, that thing that the preacher asked us to pray about. He knows the situation. It's a local situation. It's a kind of a desperate situation. And I, I wish that you would uh, lift it up before the Lord in your prayers. And let's go to the Lord now and lift up our own request 
privately and quietly and silently as we pray together and place our request before the throne of heaven. Then we'll join our hearts together as we pray. Will you join me? Lord, we thank you for the privilege it's ours to come on a Lord's Day to this house of worship and into this sanctuary and to lift our praise together before the throne of heaven. And Father, we, we confess to you that we're not quick enough to lift our praises before the throne. We're grateful in our hearts, and you know that we are. And yet, Lord, we, we're reminded that though the ten lepers were healed, only one returned to give thanks to the source of his healing and the Lord of all said, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? And Lord, we, we just pray that we might indeed be willing to come into this house of worship, thanking you for your goodness, for your blessings, so richly and fully poured out into our lives. We thank you for answers to prayer. Some are here this morning because of answers to prayer. Father, some of us are on the journey of the Christian life and on our road to eternity because someone was willing to pray for us. And Father, we're grateful this morning. We know that there are needs. They are represented here this morning, some that are very dear to our hearts that are not here this morning. And Father, we pray for the moving of your power, your spirit, your strength, your presence in their lives. And Father, we pray for healing. We pray for the strength of heart to go forward in difficult situations. Father, we've got one, one particular request that we have agreed to fast and pray before the throne of heaven uh, for this situation. And we just lift it before the throne because, Lord, we know that sometimes very, very difficult situations cannot uh, be accomplished except by, dedicated, uh, by a dedicated burden of prayer. And, Father, we just, uh, we just commit this into your hands and pray for your moving, to break down walls, to break down barriers that individuals have set up in their own hearts and in their own lives. And, Father, we pray that the Lord of peace and the Lord of love would reign over all. Now, Father, hear, hear our thanks this morning for those who serve overseas, for those who serve on the front lines of the kingdom of God, for those who are lifting up the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, possibly suffering persecution because of it. Father, encourage their hearts and strengthen them for the tasks that lay before them. For those who guard the gates of freedom, we give you thanks. We thank you that we can indeed enjoy peace and prosperity in this country. But we pray for those situations in the world where war exists and where people hate and where lives are lost, and we just pray that you would move and work. Be the God of peace among us. Help us to spread where we can the message of the Prince of Peace. Now, Father, bless us as we worship together. We come this morning through this season of Lent and looking toward Easter with needs in our hearts that perhaps can only be met by the Word of God. So we pray that you would apply the Word of God to our hearts, our minds, and our spirits. We pray these things in the matchless name of our Lord and Jesus, who taught us and his disciples prayer by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now, as the ushers come forward to receive your tithes and offerings, I'm going to ask you before the choir sings for us to join in a blessing like we often use when Miss Monica will read the text and we'll say, thanks be to God. I'm going to say these are the offerings that we bring to your house and for your kingdom's work. 
And I want you to respond as a congregation by saying thanks be to God. Lord, these are the offerings that we bring in our hands for the work of the kingdom and for the furtherance of the gospel. Amen. When we pray for our children, we pray for a lot of things. We pray for their friends and that the friendships they choose would be healthy ones. We pray for their safety and that all of their choices would be good choices. We pray for their teachers because after all, they spend much more time with them during the school year than we do. And we pray for them to come to know Christ because as they grow older, we want them to become all that God wants them to be. We may never know just how all these prayers are answered, but heaven hears every word. Don't forget to pray for them.
will take the liberty to thank Kaylee for that because um, the person that um, the pastor is asking you to pray for is a young person, a young woman that I love dearly. And that was very special. Thank you very much. And I do appreciate if all of you would pray for this person who's associated with our church. And you don't know her, but, um, but if you did, you would love her very much. And I appreciate that you pray for her this week. I'll try to pull myself together to read this. We're reading this morning from John 1, 29 through 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Monica. And before I begin, and I want you to refer to the front of the newsletter because that's where the uh, sermon series is listed that I want to work through during the, and I'm, I'm actually, a lot of, I like Celia's uh, suggestions. She had a suggestion this week, said, why don't you call it Easter Essentials? I said, I'm looking for a snappy title. Things you need for Easter is not really a too snappy of a title. But uh, she said, what about Easter Essentials? And I said, I like that. So I'm going to change the title to uh, Easter Essentials, and you'll see there the text all the way through Easter Sunday, which is March 31st. Uh, the things that you need to really celebrate Easter, and we're going to look at them from the Gospel of John. Now, I'll tell you why in just a second. But first of all, I want to say thank you to Celia and to those who led in the services last week. I heard you had wonderful services here and, uh, and I'm just I'm grateful that we have such, such a talented staff as we have in this church. And we, we are blessed. We truly are. And we had, I want you to know that we had a great Sunday with uh, my son Jimmy, the first, if you haven't heard me say it, you need to hear it again, the first uh, new United Methodist Church in Columbus, Georgia in 50 years, 50 years. And they celebrated last Sunday their third anniversary and uh, so at the closing prayer, I had to share something neat that tied into their third anniversary with something that Jimmy did when he was three years old. And I'll tell you about that sometime. But we had a great day. The bishop constituted the church. Dr. Buddy Cooper held their first charge conference. Uh, Dr. Tim Bagwell was there, who is the head of new and revitalized congregational development for our conference. And we just had a great, great time. There was almost 500 people there. And so keep, uh, keep the Ridge United Methodist Church in your prayers as they begin their spiritual journey. But I'm grateful that I can go and, and do those kinds of things and have uh, folks take over here and do such a wonderful job. And I, I want to thank Celia for uh, filling in for us. Now, the Easter essentials that we're going to look at, these, these are things that you need in order to truly celebrate Easter. And we are going to look uniquely at Easter in John. We're going to take this Lent and Easter journey to, to Easter Sunday through the book of John because John has some things that no other gospel writer has. Now, you need the entire picture in order to make it work, in order to, to understand all of it. And we, we, that's the reason that the Word of God is given to us. But you may be interested to know that and I might pose the question to you as an individual. If you were in charge of reducing a native language to an alphabet and translating the gospel, where would you start with the message that Jesus Christ is God incarnate and came into this world to provide eternal life and salvation from our sins? Where would you start? To me, it would be hard enough. It's, it's a system based on mathematics, and those of you who have taught school would understand this most better than the rest of us. But you have to first reduce a language to writing. You have to form an alphabet. I've got friends who work with Wycliffe Bible translators who do this. In fact, I have two people on two different sides of the globe that I graduated with from college who do this kind of work. And it's fascinating to hear about their work. 
And once they, once they get a native language somewhere reduced to writing, then they begin to translate the Word of God. And perhaps you've heard me say this, but you need to hear it if you have not. And that is that very likely the very first book that will be translated into someone's native language is the book of John. It is perhaps theologically the most complete book in the Word of God as far as revealing to us who Jesus is and why we need Him and why it was necessary that He come into the world. It gives us a complete understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. It gives us an understanding of the triune God. It gives us an understanding that when Christ came into this world, He was God incarnate and He came for a reason. And the reason that he came is one of the essentials that you need for Easter. Now, those of us who have had children, and I'm going to take you back a few years, maybe to your parents' time, to think about the fact when you began, when your mama began to think about Easter, what did she think about? What, what was she concerned with? Wasn't she concerned with uh, Easter Sunday, who of the family would be coming home for lunch, uh, the children's Easter egg hunt. Do you remember when you used to buy those dye kits at Publix or Winn-Dixie? And man, we, we couldn't wait to do that when we were kids. I think people still dye eggs. I don't know. With the advent of plastic eggs, I think a lot of dyeing has gone out of gone out of style. No, it hasn't, Kim. You still do it. And uh, you know, dipping those eggs in and coming up with the different colors and the Easter egg hunt and the baskets filled with candy and chocolate rabbits and then we came, became concerned with sugar in our children's diet and so maybe we don't put as much candy in the baskets as we used to but aren't those the kind of things that you kind of thought about as you prepared for Easter I want to share with you that I did a paper one time in college in a theology course now I didn't take the majority of my theology in college my father gave me great advice he said take a course major in something that you're interested in you'll find that you'll draw on it later in your ministry I knew that I'd been called to preach there was no question in my mind but he said you're going to get your in-depth Bible study college in Bible study is not going to meet by any standard the in-depth Bible study that you will get in your seminary education and that was true both at Asbury and at Emory and I was grateful for what I got but I took history, so there were one few religion courses that I had in college, but this one religion course, I wrote a paper that, I, that I'll always carry with me about the things that the world parallels with the great events that we talk about and celebrate in the Christian year. For instance, we've come through the season of Christmas a couple of months ago, and you know, for Christmas, there's Santa Claus. Now, please, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying I, I believe that you can have fun with anything at a holiday season and I believe that you can use them for fun and have fun but isn't it something the way the world wants to use things and aspects and different things to kind of move the spiritual emphasis off the screen and off the radar and I open a new tab on your computer that's got nothing to do with things spiritual and so we've got Santa and the Frosty the Snowman and the Sleigh and the Reindeer and all that kind of thing. And then we come to Easter. And we've got the money. And we've got eggs. And uh, we've got all those, those kinds of things. And I, I went so far as to make a parallel with Charlie Brown and the Great Pumpkin. Because you see, one of the great theological understandings of the church one of the great teachings that comes from the book of Acts in the first chapter after Easter when Jesus is ascending to heaven and their angels with those who have gathered to watch this they don't know what's happening ye men of Galilee why stand you here gazing into heaven for this same Jesus shall come again in like manner as you have seen him go and you see, one of the great truths of the church, one of the reasons that Lent is not a part of Sunday is because we celebrate the resurrected Christ on Sunday. And we celebrate the fact that this same Jesus is coming back again. And I, I wrote a parallel about Charlie Brown and the pumpkin patch. Oh, poor old Charlie Brown. He sits in the pumpkin patch waiting for the great pumpkin that never comes. 
You see, there are a lot of things that the world would like to use to draw away the emphasis. Like I say, you can have fun with anything. But we need to remember what the essentials of Easter are. And the first essential that I want to share with you this morning is very simply identification. Identification. We need to understand who Easter, for whom Easter exists and why it exists. Who this person Jesus is. And John gives us an identification that nobody else in the Gospels gives us. The Johannine Gospel, as it's called, the Johannine Writings, give us something that no other writer in the New Testament gives us. He gives us the Agnus Dei. Well, Jim, what's the Agnus Dei? I didn't have Latin in high school. It's the Lamb of God. It is the Lamb of God. And let me say at the beginning, you need a lamb at Easter. You need the Lamb of God at Easter. Now, they say that one of the wonderful architectural aspects of the Mormon tabernacle in Salt Lake, Utah, is that you can stand at the front in the choir loft and drop a pin, and it can be heard all the way at the back in the balcony with no amplification. I don't know if that's true, but do you remember the telephone company that had the, had the advertisement where they dropped the pin, and can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I stood... On the stage, actually, there were others. I stood there first before I looked up at this stadium built by the Romans, an amphitheater outside of Amman, Jordan. I saw it on the news the other night. I've been there. And a group was standing down below, and they said, Now, some of you, I was a lot younger at the time, said, Some of y'all need to go to the top of this amphitheater. And y'all, I, I forget, it was something like 70 or 80 steps to the top. It would seat 35,000 people in this amphitheater. And they performed plays, Roman plays, on the stage with no amplification whatsoever. I had to hear that for myself. I've always been involved with sound. I've liked the study of sound and the characteristics and so on and the needs and architecture with sound and so on. I made the trip. There were only a couple of us that made the trip to the very top. But I stood on that top row and I listened to the conversations that were being held on the stage those folks looked like ants down there from where I was standing. And I could hear every word that they said. It was nothing short of amazing. I want you to hear the fact that on this day when John is baptizing in the River Jordan, and let me tell you, John is standing there doing something that historically there's more position, there's more understanding for this method of baptism than any other mode. We practice all modes in the in the Methodist church. We can sprinkle, we can pour, we can immerse. Doesn't To us, it, the, the quantity of water is not what's important. It's what the grace of God does in that act of, of baptism. But John was no doubt taking a pitcher of water and dipping it into the Jordan River and pouring it over the head of those who were being baptized. And John very plainly said, and you will miss some of the significance of this if you don't go home this afternoon and read the preceding verses leading up to the text that Monica read for us this morning. It tells about John the Baptist, John the baptizer, who wore camel's hair and ate locusts and wild honey and began to preach and teach that there was one coming after him, but he was baptizing for the repentance of sins. Now, let me tell you something. I know a lot of people who repent of sin, and they repent of sin every day, and it does nothing for them. What does repentance mean? Repentance means simply to turn around and walk in the opposite direction. John was baptizing for the repentance of sin. I am impressed with those who want to repent of sin and turn around and walk in the right direction. But unless we have the understanding that our sin has been forgiven, then it bears down upon us and the guilt of sin will take us right back to it. And I want to say to you this morning, you need a lamb. You say, Jim, why do you keep saying that? 
this is what I want to share with you this morning. You need a lamb and I need a lamb because we sin. You see, when you go back to Exodus, the 12th chapter, you read there the story of what happened when Moses, through nine plagues, had gotten Pharaoh to the jumping off point. Okay, you can take them. Get out of here. I've had enough of this. No, you're not going to take them. And this last plague was the worst. And you see, God came to Moses and he said, Moses, now tell the children of Israel this, that on this night they're to take a lamb and they're to kill it and they're to eat all of it before daybreak. If not, whatever's left, burn it up in the fire, unleavened bread, bitter herbs, spices. Have your coat, your staff, be ready to go. But he said, take the blood of that lamb and put it on the doorpost. And you see, when the angel of death comes through Egypt, he's going to stop at every household. And it doesn't matter whether it's the firstborn of the oxen, of the cattle, of the children. The angel of death is going to kill all of the firstborn except in the houses where he sees the blood of the lamb. And so the Israelites began to go from house to house. We need a lamb. We need a lamb. We don't want death to come into our household. And the Word of God says that every single family was faithful. And they found a lamb. And their lives were preserved. And the lives of their firstborn were preserved. Now, a pin dropped on the edge of the Jordan River the sound of which would reverberate through eternity, although it was just one man's voice. John looked up and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God, the Agnus Dei in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Now those of us who have close associations to Lexington will usually tell you that not much good can come out of Louisville, Kentucky. But in the Church of the Assumption in Louisville, Kentucky, there is a beautiful stained glass window that has in it a rendition of the Agnus Dei. John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now listen, three reasons you need a lamb at Easter. And Jesus needs to be known to you as that Passover lamb. First of all, because we sin. What? Is that a surprise to anybody? Is that a surprise to you? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Have you ever heard the saying that sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go and keep you longer than you ever intended to stay? With the incredible destroying results in the life and in the body. And you need a lamb. You see, all of the Passover sacrifices that had ever been done through eternity could not take away sin. It could only cover up. And this is probably just a juvenile observation on my part. I'm kind of a simple guy. But I have a feeling that God got tired of looking at creation with all that unforgiven sin. Oh, a lot of repentance. A lot of people have turned over enough leaves to fill up a forest. But we needed a lamb to take away the sin of the world. To forgive my sin. So that I could enjoy what my creator intended when he made me. And I need a lamb. We need a lamb because we sin. We need a lamb because God promised. He didn't want his creation to live with sin and its deadly results. He wanted to make a way for you to be in fellowship with him. And you see, if you continue to live in sin and be disobedient, you see, 
I, I, I got to tell you this. Some of us are in trouble this morning. Some of us are in trouble because we haven't allowed the Lamb of God who came to take away sin to take it away and to forgive us. And then finally, it was time. It was time. I, I don't understand all of that. But I think that God got tired of looking at unforgiven sin in the past, the possibility of unforgiven sin in the future, because you see, he's not bound by time. But the question of sin is ever present. And he sent his only son into the world to be the Passover lamb. Did I tell you that John is the only gospel writer who gives us this image and this picture? This beautiful, inspiring thought that when John recognized him standing in the crowd, this was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in four weeks, in four weeks, we're going to see what victory over sin looked like and what it can look like for you. You see, he wants to forgive. He wants to cleanse. He wants to make whole. And this morning, we're not going to read out of the hymnal. I'm going to consecrate these elements, and we're going to serve the servers and then the choir, and then the ushers are going to bring you to this table. But I want to share this with you, that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And just as the Passover lamb was sacrificed, Jesus said, this is the body of the Agnus Dei. This is the body that for those of you who are living in the brokenness of sin, the unforgiveness of sin and guilt that weighs you down, this is the body which was broken for you to experience wholeness and forgiveness and peace and love and joy and acceptance. This is the Lamb of God whose body was broken for you. And then the Word of God says that after supper he took the cup. And does it mean anything of more significance to you to understand that this is the blood of the Passover Lamb? That when God sees the blood of the Paschal Lamb of the Agnus Dei, you don't have to die eternally? Oh, friend, I hope that meets your heart where it meets mine. Jesus said, this is my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you do this, do it remembering that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you see why we say at Easter, you need a lamb. You need the lamb now. Dear God, we come remembering this morning and giving thanks in our hearts that you are the Lamb of God who can forgive our sin no matter how bad we think it is or how bad you think it is. It can be forgiven in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the servers, if they will, to come and join me here and we'll serve the servers and then the ushers will give you direction after the choir has received.
Now, as you come to this altar this morning, you may choose to leave an offering, and I want to say to you that um, in our, we're, we're going to receive a special offering, Shane. Uh, we're going to receive a special offering at the altar this morning. We're going to engage in an Easter advertising campaign to advertise United Methodist Churches in Glenn County. And we've been asked to participate in this campaign. It wasn't our idea, but I think it's a great idea. Um, for instance, the chapel is going to be about a $6,000 ad campaign. The chapel, the largest Methodist church in the, in the Golden Isles, is taking on $2,100 of this effort, ours, our portion, and they've got it ranked according to our size, our portion is $800. And if you'd like to help us with this, uh, I think it's a wonderful idea, a wonderful thing. Uh, we're just going to advertise United Methodist Churches in the Glen Isle leading up to, in the Golden Isles leading up to Easter. So join with us. The offering that you leave at the altar this morning is going to go toward, uh, toward this. Father, we are grateful for the blood that was given for us. Help us to receive your gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, the blood of Christ given for you. Lord Jesus, we need what you have to give us this morning. Help us to receive it. In Christ's name, amen.
Jesus. Jesus, give me your glory. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we remember that John later said in his other writings that the life of the blood is it, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Help us to understand what you have done for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we are grateful that you are the Paschal Lamb to us. You are the Lamb of the Passover. Lord, pass over us because of Jesus. In his name, amen.
Jesus, the Passover. The blood of the Passover lamb. Father, we're reminded that the Israelites rejoice with joy at the gift given to them, the gift of their firstborn. And yet you gave your firstborn into this world in order that we might have life and have it eternally. Help us to have thankful hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. given for you. over. Lord God, we receive many things from your hands for which we're grateful. You bless our lives, but Lord, you have blessed us for eternity if we accept the forgiveness you offered because of the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus, give me favor. Little Jesus, give me favor. Little Christ. Just little Christ, give me favor. Little Jesus, give me favor. Father, just as the high priest on the Day of Atonement took the blood of the spotless lamb before the Ark of the Covenant, so it is that Christ carried his own blood into that Holy of Holies once and for all. Give us grateful hearts in Christ's name. Amen. wasn't on I'm sorry if you contact Susan Bunkley she will uh, help to hook you up with being able to do this now these are the elements as they're prepared to go in the home and there is also a script that you can use you don't have to feel like you've got to make anything up when you go in and it's a blessing it's a blessing to take communion to someone who is unable to be in church so if you ever want to do that please uh, feel free to join this ministry let's join our hearts together as we consecrate these elements and these who will go into the homes Father, we're grateful because so much has been given to us. When we were yet unworthy, when we were yet unlovable, in our sins, the Word says, Christ died for us. And Father, we're grateful this morning. And these elements represent the gift that God has given to us through Christ. 
we ask your blessing upon these who go into homes to carry this wonderful and sacred and blessed truth. Strengthen them as they go. May they be blessed themselves. And, Father, certainly meet the needs of those to whom they minister. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if the rest of you will stand, we'll sing in closing two verses of Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. If there's ever a person who ought to leave the church joyfully, it is you if you know you're forgiven. The Word of God says on the night that the Lord's Supper was instituted that when they had sung a hymn, they went out. You're dismissed.